So then again, uh, welcome everyone to our webinar today on training for in, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship skills of displaced and refugee academics. For a very quick introduction, uh, again, we have a, a basic agenda, agenda today um, where we first in the first um, part touch on uh, basic concepts of innovation and inventions. We will touch on intellectual property rights and their protection, including copyrights, patents, and what's in, uh, necessary to know and also on innovation processes, open innovation, impact canvas, um, these kind of techniques. All these will be done by my dear colleague, Peter Aleshnik. And the second part with an interactive intermezzo will then uh, move over to uh, more advanced concepts like industry 4.0 and 5.0 and um, get into some details that are specifically important for refugees and displaced academics. So um, with this, I'm uh, kindly inviting our colleague, uh, Peter, to start his presentation and um, also kindly briefly introduce himself. So at this point, you should see my screen. Right, just a short confirmation would be yes. excellent from Sebastian. Thank you. So I'm Peter, I'm coming from Knowledge Transfer Office from University of Ljubljana. I'm uh, the head of unit for strengthening innovation and entrepreneurial culture at the university. Um, myself, I have, I have quite some experience in um, startup, from startup world. I've uh, tried my best uh, I, I should say three times already. I'm an innovator myself, so I have quite some experience in, in that field. So today I will talk in three parts. Um, first part will be from idea to market. Um, the second part uh, will be about IPR. And the third part is uh, introducing you one tool that you can use in your uh, daily work. Um, during the nice introduction that Sebastian uh, had, you know, it, it looked like everything is separated, but the case is it's not. So a lot of things will be kind of uh, merged together. Um, and um, yeah, we will see how things will develop. I invite you to stop me every time uh, you you have an urge to comment or to, to, to pose a question so we can um, answer that uh, kind of immediately. Right, so the first thing is, you know, we have to talk about these two, uh, yeah, words, uh, invention versus innovation, yeah? So invention is when you create something new. Sometimes it's completely, so entirely new. Sometimes it's not so new. It's new for you, but maybe not for the world. And innovation is when you put these ideas and these um, inventions um, into the market. In other words, we say that you create value. Yeah. So uh, invent invention often results from uh, a moment of insight or, uh, you know, some kind of combination of research and development efforts, uh, you know, it requires usually a high level of creativity or technical skills as well. Yeah. Although innovation, on the other hand, it's more about this iterative process uh, when you improve or adapt an idea and invention or product um, kind of meets the customer needs Yeah, and create even more new market opportunities. And, um, from you, actually, when you put innovation into place, it often um, seeks kind of cross-disciplinary knowledge and experiences and techniques and teams, even collaboration and some kind of you know, business acumen. Yeah? And if I summarize it um, nicely, um, while inventions can exist standalone, yeah, maybe in your drawer or in your paper or in your book or whatever. Um, if, even as a prototype in your lab, you know, covered with a 
uh, dust blanket. Um, innovation for sure isn't such type because um, to ensure that the full potential of invention is reached, um, you have to go through refinement, scaling, integration um, into existing markets and segments, or you know, create even creating totally, totally new one. And um, maybe you know, at this point, you think, "Whoa, this is too much." But the case is that actually there are methods, techniques, and tools that you can use um, to coming up with the great ideas and inventions, and also to help you to help you with succeeding uh, at placing uh, innovations on the market. And I'm doing PhD actually just from that small section. So I'm trying to um, to get um, research or to get really deep on how these methods and tools and uh, techniques collaborate together through the whole uh, innovation process. Right. Um, so, you know, let's talk a little bit more about both of, of the invention and innovation. Yeah. For myself, the wheel is actually, yeah, one of the invention there was in the world. Yeah. It was, it approximately originated about 6,000 years ago. Uh, as a Slovenian, I always have to say that, you know, in Slovenia, we found the oldest preserved wheel in the world. And, and you can see it in the in our National Museum. Um, and, you know, this invention was actually quite pivotal in human development. You can imagine that, you know, we started to be more ease in transport. We started to have some kind of new devices, like for the agriculture and industry and it was also foundation for subsen um, for additional mechanical inventions like gears you know in clocks and and gears in 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 transmissions and all that stuff yeah um the other invention that was you know is transform uh transformed our, our world quite quite substantially was the internet yeah it was you know some kind of test you do in your lab and then it 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 morphed into you know and expanded into the this thing that we are today heavily dependent on it revolutionized information exchange commerce connectivity yeah because of the internet we can talk and, and collaborate at very this moment. Um, it also kind of catalyzed the emergence of the global economy and uh, networking and, you know, the age as we call it, uh, information age, right? And the third thing that is on the edge right now, I think it's uh, AI, so uh, artificial intelligence. It's not new as, you know, a lot of inventions we will see later on they're not something new yeah at the moment we are talking about but but yeah um today it's already powering um analytical systems um um decision systems um it's backbone for personal assistance for us for predictive analytics uh, in healthcare, in in weather, in traffic, in even new drug discoveries. Um, so, and it continually involves um, into a solution that will augment uh, human capabilities and um, automate actually very complex uh, tasks. Yeah. Um, so. But the invention and innovation is not just about technical stuff. Yeah, it's also driving uh, society forward. Yeah, and um, the innovations have been often at the heart of historical shifts, um, such as you know industrial revolution, informational revolution, as we are present now, 
um, innovations like printing press, um, you know, in 15th century, um, democratized knowledge, as, as we say today, yeah? And, um, you know, it broadened the, the intellectual landscape at that time. And, uh, you know, one might say that uh, AI is going to play a major role in next shift. Yeah? Um, there are also, you know, advancements in the medical fields, uh, digital revolution uh, mentioned before. Yeah? For example, you know, penicillin that was invented in 1920, um, it represents or mark the beginning of... Uh, antibiotic revolution yeah it was the first time that we had some such an option that you know by using some drug we drastically reduced mortality yeah from bacterial infections and uh, for example also the microprocessor that you know that actually um is the basis for every device we use today yeah? and we cannot actually imagine the world without without devices yeah um but there's e e even more beyond that yeah it, nowadays we are talking more and more about sustainable agriculture and clean water technologies why because you know it in a few years this is going to be a bottleneck i would say for for you know ease of life um and um i think that you know the most important maybe message from this slide is actually the last point that innovation is actually a continuous cycle of problem solving um, and improvement um it means that it's not one time event but you know a continuous process um that you know brought us here from where we were and you know we invented wheel and then somebody invented gears and then somebody invented uh belts and etc etc so you know today we are um in a world full of inventions yeah and innovations as well yeah? um and this cycle is actually uh you know for the researchers um maybe this is yeah the most uh, value yeah because this cycle is driven by curiosity, yeah, and uh, the need for um, efficiency, and uh, kind of the quest for sustainability, and um, you know, and in in especially when you are focusing on sectors like renewable energy, biotechnology, clean uh, clean technologies, and etc. Um, but you know, let's move more and more into the into the uh, subject why innovation is actually so important in today's world. Yeah, um, and you know, the, if if you would ask companies, yeah, they would say that innovation is important because with innovation, um, they're being kind of differentiated from their competition. That means that um, they're one step ahead. Yeah? And of course, if you have been one step ahead, then you know your neighbor has a problem because he's he's not selling as much stuff as as as, as the competitive company. Yeah? So innovation is also very much needed when you try to uh, neutralize the hit given by the market opponent yeah mm -hmm. and um so you know in, in in essence the players on the market play this kind of um game or you know they're forced to play catch-up game yeah so one is uh introducing some innovation and, and it's better than the other company try to neutralize or even surpass them and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in, in this manner, we are, as a um, consumers, yeah, we are advan uh, advancing from that process because we are getting for the same value, 
or for the same money, I would say better and better solutions. Yeah, but there is also a third kind of um, reason why um, innovation is important because um, it improves productivity. Uh, that means that you are trying to think up solutions um, with which you are freeing up resources. And that means that, um, you know, if today two persons are needed to, to do one thing, then maybe tomorrow with some advancement, only half a person is needed to do that thing. And that means that one and a half person are optional to use in other processes. Yeah? But there is also, you know, the other side of the coin in innovation because a lot of waste is happening. Yeah? And um, there is a lot of failed attempts, which, you know, if we learn from is good, but nevertheless, we lose uh, resources. Yeah? So we have to be very careful about um, um, optionizing these wastes uh, from innovation. <clears throat> Um, this innovation matrix uh, represents uh, four different types of innovation spaces. And uh, as you, you can imagine, innovation is not one size fits all process. Um, with innovation, you're actually exploring new territories uh, you're going into. Yeah? And places no one went there before sometimes. And as a researcher, you're constantly pushing towards the edge of known. Yeah? And that means um, that you know you are in a domain which is not well defined. Um, just a second, yeah. You are in a in a place which is not well defined and uh, in terms of domain. So there is no sometimes knowledge available to to help you with the with, with the problem. And you know a lot of times also the problems are not uh, well defined. And um, here you can also see with which um, tools you can uh, solve such problems. Yeah? If, if, if you have a problem that is not well defined and also you, you, know, you don't know actually which knowledge do you need, then research and academic partnerships are great. Yeah? So also for you, to know how to persuade your industrial partners to collaborate, you know, you have to find one that uh, they are working in the not well-defined domain with a problem which is not well-defined. Yeah, but if you have some, uh, well, you know, if you are working in a well-defined domain and you know the problem very well, then there are other techniques which are useful um, to solve such uh, problems. And uh, of course, yeah, acquisitions and um, research and development labs work just fantastically uh, in that field as well. Um, let's take another look on innovation metrics where we can see which types of innovations they are if we are talking about impact on the market and uh, technology newness, yeah? So if we are, you know, introducing some kind of innovation that is you know, not very uh, technological new, yeah? And it has very little impact on the market. Um, it means it's incremental. Uh, one example of, of such innovation would be software update. Yeah, when I started the Zoom, I you know I clicked um, updates, and you know it downloaded me updates. So it was some kind of innovation. I don't know what I downloaded, but you know it's needed because during the presentation, if the window pops up, we have to update. This is not um, well received from uh, from you know from uh, from people. So um, these are very incremental innovations. And if you are doing incremental innovations, there are some rules you have to kind of 
think of. Yeah, you're not going with uh, you know with a lot of um, money into it, but you're you know sometimes it's just another color. Yeah, if I make a joke for 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 example, yeah, or just a uh, uh, you know you make something transparent that was the last version was not transparent. Yeah, like a lead or something like that. Yeah, there are also innovations where. Um, they introduce a really, um, you know, in 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 a level of of uh, it's 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 technologies um, new, yeah. It's it's something that was wasn't introduced to a market before, and um, but the impact on the market is something that is not um, uh, so radical, yeah. And in that case, we are talking about radical innovations. And brothers or sisters of that of that innovations are disruptive innovations, and when we are talking about disruptive innovations, comparing to the ra radical innovations, disruptive innovations um, disrupt as you know as it is in the names um, traditional services. A good example of disruptive innovation is section Netflix, yeah, which. Um, disrupted traditional cable and video rental businesses because you don't have to pay for renting, you know, the um, the CD or the DVD or the the tape that we did in in the old times, but you just go online and 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 the you know the blackbuster is actually um, at, at your fingertips. Although um, you know, if we are talking about radical innovations. Um, some kind of new platform for communication or or that kind of things are are in that category. Um, having explored the innovation met metrics uh, where we categorized innovations by their impact and novelty and and that stuff, um, we uh, we you can also place innovations in a, in a S curve, yeah, which measures or illustrates the progression from in in the scope of time and in technological or market development. And this S curve actually represents also a life of a single innovation on a market, yeah, where we have um, four phases. Yeah, one is introduction phase, um, one is growth phase. One is maturity phase, and one is need for new innovation. Or, as you know, when we are at the end of some kind of innovation, or the innovation becomes obsolete, then it's time for such innovation. Um, you know, to end the production, for example, of such of such device, and it's time for a new innovation. And um, now, if we zoom further. We can also see that uh, these phases break down into segments, which represent different groups of adopters. Um, we call it yeah, innovators. These are visionaries, actually, who adopt first and are willing to take risks. They usually don't uh, think about in money metrics, yeah, because they they buy stuff which is um, uh, expensive, you know the only person you knew that would buy such thing. Uh, the next segment is early adopters. Um, these are more kind of informed in individuals um, who are little, uh, leaders in social settings and uh, adopt innovations early on. Um, yeah, uh, and then there are early majorities, um, kind of pragmatic, uh, um, but still, this this segment adopts uh, the innovation before the average person. Then we have late majority, um, which are kind of skeptical individuals, but um, they adopt after the majority of society has accepted uh, the innovation. And the laggards, um, which are last to adopt and uh, kind of resistant to change because they are anchored in 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 the old um innovations yeah and um 
you know, as we see the S curve kind of evolve from single technology to an overlapping one, um, it, you know, it's evident that that the old technologies are disrupted by you know current innovation or the new innovations. And uh, of course, some succeed, yeah, but many do not. And um, this point of life in innovation, it's also called a uh, chasm. And it represent, the chasm uh, represents actually um, the critical gap between early adopters yeah, and uh, early majority. So in kind of in this, in this part, yeah? And um, because there is a moment where the innovation uh, crosses um, uh, to mass market um, and uh, where it's actually a place where a lot of or many products fail uh, to gain broader market acceptance. Yeah? But, you know, through, some, through time, some innovations prevail and uh, replaces actually the old one, yeah? And um, there's actually also a time where both of the generations or the both of technologies uh, coexist. Um, and if we move forward, um, the pattern continues as new technologies actually emerge, creating a sequence of S cures, um, uh, each of them, uh, kind of, you know, represents the birth of, of new innovation and the eventual position to more advanced solutions. Um, and, you know, you can imagine that in such places, uh, you know, at universities, uh, researchers are creating our uh, future, if I may say, and, uh, you know, future technologies and uh, future knowledge uh, that we will use in the upcoming years and um, will shape the world of uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as said at the beginning, um, to be better at innovation, we can use very systematic uh, processes yeah? because um, it's, 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 a, it's a process that if you uh, follow kind of the rules of a process, uh, the end, um, you have better chances to see the end. Yeah, it's kind of kind of the same as as it is with a uh, you know standard research you do. Um, and one of the innovation processes that is really easy to describe is uh, design thinking. It's um, separated in two. Uh, parts. First part is called uh, problem space, and the second part is called solution space. In problem space, you are trying to really hard to understand uh, the problem. Yeah, you're trying to articulate precisely um, what the problem is or the challenge is. Yeah, and um, it actually um, the intention is that um, you start, of course, searching for ideas um, and understanding the challenge, the problem uh, by observation and, and a lot of other techniques. And when you articulate the problem and the challenge, you're good to go further because you try at that point, ideate uh, for new solutions and for ideas and for the prototypes where you build it and you test it. And there is a loop where you go back and try to see if you understood correctly. Yeah? And you do it, um, this process, as soon as possible and with as little resources as possible. Yeah? Um, and you repeat this process many times um, if needed. And it's um, in design thinking, it's actually, um, you know, many, many, many tools you can use for each of the phases. 
um, through my own research, I found more than 700 or, you know, nearly, um, I would say e e even more than 800 innovative techniques or tools that you, that you could use in such uh, phases. Um, some tools can be used only in one phase, while others can be used uh, in almost every phase. Yeah? But the important thing for you to know is actually that um, it's important that you follow um, this kind of uh, sequence. Yeah, it's not important where you start actually, but the only thing that is important is to follow a sequence and that there are tools you can use to get the information in that sequence. Right, and maybe additional note um, to the to the innovators, because in design thinking, there is um, quite well-known um, um, term, T-shaped individual, yeah? which means that on one part, you are very skillful in one direction, yeah, but in many parts, there are additional knowledge you possess. And to have a really good team, you have to find another persons that are, you know, experts in other possessions, in, in on, 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 on other subjects, but at the same time, they share maybe a few of the fields, uh, you know, in terms of passion, in terms of knowledge, in terms of uh, expertise or the network uh, with you, yeah? And with that kind of analogy, you try to get um, the perfect uh, team together, yeah? And you as an individual, you also fit uh, in other teams um, just like that, yeah? So they are trying to find an expert, which is, um, you know, very, we who can go very deep in one, um, subject, but possesses also knowledge from other um, fields. And you can imagine if, if you have a team which is combined of, you know, five of such individual, you know, individuals, you have a really uh, strong group, um, you know, to do the, the, the innovation process. Um, yeah, before going further, I would talk just a little bit about closed uh, and open innovation process. I'm sure you are at least, you, you have already at least some, some degree of knowledge on, on that topic because it's so obvious, yeah? So in closed innovation process, you have a syndrome um, which kind of um, is summarized like in that, not invented here, yeah? Which means that if if it's not invented here in our place, if we don't, um, um, you know, control everything, then it's a, it, it, it's a no-go. So we are very closed, um, in a very closed innovation process. So although if you open up the innovation process, um, to outside, yeah, a lot of external knowledge can be can can go, to, you know, into your innovation process, and a lot of solutions can go outside of the your innovation process. Which means that, um, you know, if you are, for example, innovating or researching just lights, or you know, for uh, automoto uh, segment, and you come up with you know with a new kind of uh, I don't know circuit for for lights and 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 these kind of lights can be also used uh, at the home appliance uh, market. Yeah, not just as with the closed innovation process, you would use it just for the automotive um, segment and not for the home appliances. And um, you know the the companies are trying to um, to shift from closed to open innovation processes because they they need to be more agile yeah they need to broader insights and uh, they have to be more efficient 
um, in uh, in a process where they bring their inventions to the market, uh, because you know the world uh, the world today is globalized and um, there are a lot of competition from everywhere in and if you can imagine that you know your competitor is doing the open innovation process and collaborating with universities to gain knowledge to gain new insights to get a perspective and you are not you're just you know trying to be sufficient on your own processes and and people um i'm sure that you know sometimes closed innovation process is better but for many 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 cases i think and uh, I promote open innovation processes. Right. Um, but now I would like to talk just a little bit on how to innovate at the university, right? Because at the university, we have to pay attention to, to coexisting strategies. So we, we have research, we have, um, you know, this collaboration with 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 uh, with my with, with our peers with with companies and we try to follow the habilitation rules so we get promoted and that stuff yeah so this is the standard process that kind of um, describes the uh, how to go from research to to granted patent yeah and even beyond to end of a of a life of a patent, yeah, and it's usually that you know you you're doing the, re the research and you know at some point there is an invention, you have to uh, know you have to send a notice to the employer, and then if it's you know worthwhile um, to to put additional resources into it. Then you start drafting the patent application and you file a patent application. And then there's a process where um, the patent, uh, patent gets granted. Um, you have to do the national validations if it's international patent. And then each year you uh, pay renewal fees. And after 20 years, there is an end of a patent. Yeah? We, we, we will go through patent um, in the second part, just uh, just a little bit later, um, but you know this is the the general um, idea about the invention. Yeah, but then we you know there is an articles yeah which is uh, the main kind of um, driver for for many many um, of the researchers. Yeah, and we have to pay attention that uh, if we disclose an article. Uh, our invention, and we try to uh, patent it afterwards. Uh, we cannot because the 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 articles is uh, state of the art and it's already published um, and uh, available to everyone. So uh, there is no way we can patent such invention. Yeah. So therefore, we have to pay attention that we file uh, priority patent application. And after that moment, um, the article is possible, but if we disclose something that is part of, you know, new invention that is coming up, then we are in the same troubles as we were before. Yeah? So um, I encourage researchers always to talk um, about this situation uh, with their uh, technology transfer officers, or colleagues, because sometimes it's, you know, as you would imagine, yeah, there are a lot of places where you can um, collaborate with with the companies or uh, other uh, stakeholders, yeah, but it's important that you collaborate in um, right way, yeah, which means that you sign um, non-disclosure agreements with them, that uh, you know you file for patent and then you try to disclose the you know the the really um, uh, important details about uh, your innovation yeah right 
I, I will conclude this first part uh, with just um, uh, good principles from, um, well, they're actually great principles from uh, two authors that I, or two books that I um, encourage you to, to maybe read more about, because uh, if you are interested in that subject, there are a lot of um, authors that cover um, you know, innovation processes and, and that. So the first one is, um, you know, how we as an innovators can become better. Um, and uh, Christensen put five uh, kind of principles that are associated to a good uh, innovator. And the first one is associating. Yeah, So linking different uh, ideas, um, it's about making connections between uh, kind of unrelated concepts and, and industry. Um, yeah, and you know, it's about putting together pieces of puzzle from different uh, angles or boxes uh, to create you know something new, some new uh, perspective, some new ideas. Questioning is is an, another principle which is very relevant because you actually challenge usual ways of uh, thinking yeah? uh, observing because um yeah with daily life we often you know go uh, straight ahead to the to the point but sometimes you have to you know kind of do the the step backwards and uh, you know observe things which means sometimes you have to go really um into the details but sometimes you have to I take a look at the at the um, um, forest, right? Um, the fourth principle is it's quite interesting. It's, um, um, it's also networking yeah? because sometimes you get these new ideas from from other people, yeah, and you have to spend time actually to do it properly and. Um, and yeah, it's it's connected maybe also to previous principles because if you network, then you are associated, then you are questioned, uh, then you are observing. Yeah? And the last thing, which is I think obvious in terms of researchers, is experimenting, which means that um, yeah, you blend and test ideas, um, forge kind of new um, new ones. Yeah. Right, and 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 the second one is um, a lot of um, a lot of questions in innovation process comes from um, monetization point of view, yeah? and uh, the book I recommend is actually monetizing innovation, uh, but the main message from the book, uh, which I experienced also you know firsthand actually. Uh, many times is that the most important it is for you to understand customer needs. Yeah, by that it's it's also you know asking them not just um, what do they do, how do they do it, why is this relevant for their lives and that stuff, but also how much they pay for this kind of solutions they use. How much would they pay? You know the at the top, yeah. How much would they pay at the bottom? Um, you know, what kind of solution would it be? You know, for them to pay two hundred euros per month, yeah, and that stuff. So, a lot about uh, gathering information uh, on pricing, on the value uh, that is um, representing the solution for the uh, for the consumers. Yeah. And the last point, fail fast, learn faster, means that actually, you know, if you are, um, the common thing usually is that, you know, we are in love with our idea. Yeah. And that means that we are, we would like to see it as soon as possible in, in a physical world, uh, usually. Yeah. That means that, we would like to see that the blue, you know, light coming out, and in the bottom that uh, uh, the button that would, uh, you know, glow in, in, and that stuff, and and we spend too much 
resources and time and, and, and energy on, on prototyping, you know, the first prototype and not, but not getting the information from the user if this is actually something they need and in which format and, um, you know, which actually, um, you know, features um, should be there because a lot of times we as an in innovators think that, you know, some kind of feature is necessary for the consumers and we spent, you know, a lot of time there, a lot of money, a lot of resources. But at the end, if we would ask our customers if this feature is something that are, you know, they're willing to pay 20,000 euros additional, they would say no, because it's it's not used, because we use it in that in that direction. And um, that's, you know, the again the main message of 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 this author which i find really really relevant so by that i'm ending my first um first part um is there maybe some questions some um some uh, comments or whatever No, good. Uh, so the next part is focusing on IPR. Yeah, um, it's to get you just a little bit deeper on what intellectual property um, subject is about. Um, yeah, and 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 why it's 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 relevant um, for you or for us. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the first question we should ask uh, ourselves is probably why the IP system was invented, yeah, in, in, on, in, in, in first place, yeah, and it was invented because you as an innovator, uh, you actually, you know, doing research for 20 years, but not just you, you know, your whole team or your mentor, you know, was doing the research on the subject for the, you know, 20 years before you started the research. And, and as said, you know, there's a lot of team effort going on and, and institution puts a lot of money or the, you know, the, the country into the, into the new equipment, the, the, the facilities and that stuff. Yeah. And because we make significant investment in, in developing new products, um, we, we needed a system to actually, um, that would um, allow us to make a value out of our um, uh, investments. Yeah, Because, you know, the easy thing is that if you are a, comp a competitor, yeah, and you are looking at the market on on the things that are developed, yeah, um, you can just copy it, yeah. That would be the you know the best uh, kind of situation for you, yeah, and um, you know you would just offer similar or identical uh, product possibly at a cheaper price or if you had already a uh, shelf in in supermarket you would just put this kind of um product on the shelf yeah and this would uh, kind of be a situation where nobody would like you know would be willing to invest into the into the innovation process because at the end you know the competitors would get a free ride on the back of your creativity and and, and efforts and that's why the ip system is there to help actually innovators to protect protect their inventions designs brands uh works yeah, and so on it provides um them with ownership uh, over their work 
and the rights to exclude uh, kind of competitors from uh, the production, import, uh, sales um, of these uh, goods. Yeah, and this is why we we invented um, actually IP system. Um, yeah, right. Um, so you know, in one product, there are actually many, many IP rights. Yeah, and if you take a look at this phone, um, I, I'm sure that you know, if I would ask you one by one, uh, which IP do you think uh, there is, uh, you would say, yeah, for sure, you know, it's a brand, uh, so trademark, yeah, Nokia. Or a startup tone, yeah, da, 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 or something like that, yeah, or marimba from from Apple, yeah. Um, on the other hand, it's copyright, so um, the whole tunes like uh, ringtones and uh, images and uh, you know user manuals and uh, software and that stuff, but also patents and uh, utility models, yeah. So uh, you know how the phone connects to the base station via. Um, cell network and how the base station is is uh, uh, communicating, uh, you know, the call to to your friend's device and that stuff. This is a technical solution to technical problems. So um, the IP right that kind of solves that is uh, patenting, yeah, and designs because uh, if you if your form is actually um, um sorry just a second uh if, if your form is doing some value for the for the um for the end user or it's the uh you know it's 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 differentiation from another products then design is also something that you would like to uh have uh, secured yeah right um so if we go through different types of uh, types of IP, just in in a in a in a concise uh, manner, so you know we have patents uh, there for new inventions. Um, the process is uh, application, so we have to apply for a patent, and there is a process of examination. Yeah? Somebody takes a look at your patent application and and, and decides um, if it's new, if it's um, innovative um, and if it's applicable yeah then you have utility models uh, which are also meant for new inventions they're um, kind of for these purposes um, they look alike patterns but they are more easy to to get um, then you have copyrights uh, which are meant to secure um, you know your um, uh, original creative and, and artistic form um, and they exist actually automatically with the with the moment of your uh, creation yeah? of, of, of the creation of, of, of some uh, your work. Uh, duration is actually um, roughly the life of, of the author plus uh, plus 70 years yeah. But it depends on 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 the country. So there are also trademarks uh, which are meant for uh, distinctive identification of products and services. Um, you have to register for that. So the point of trademark is that if you would be in a shop where on a shelf there would be only um, uh, white bottles and on the bottles you would be allowed to just to use the the name uh in typo not not in um um not uh, in visuals yeah so just just the word uh typed word and and the trademark you know would would mean a lot and if if on one bottle you would see coca-cola and on the other you would see pepsi yeah you would know just by that trademark, what kind of uh, you know uh, water or what what kind of um, product is inside that that um, that bottle? 
and um, it's got the same. It, it goes the same with uh, register designs. So it's for securing actually external appearance, and uh, you do it also by uh, re registration. Um, here we have an example of Coca Cola bottle, where um, you know you cannot have the same product. Uh, with different colors as a uh, as a lid and, and as a uh, sticker, um, you know. But just having the same the same uh, bottle design uh, that that would mean that Coca Cola would go after you and and sue you because you are using their uh, registered uh, designs. And the last, but you know, but there are also other forms of IP uh, which are not shown here because uh, uh, it, it would be too too detailed but the last one here on the list is trade secret uh, which is actually valuable information not known to the public um, and you secure it uh, with reasonable efforts to actually keep it secret yeah and now let's go just a little bit deeper in in on patent, yeah. Um, patent is actually um, technical solution to a technical problem. Yeah, you have to have a technical problem at first, um, and with your knowledge, you are thinking up about new solutions. And uh, if you write the solution in a paper, um, and you apply for a patent, um, and the patent um is granted you you know, you you're given an exclusive right um for you to kind of decide who will use uh this patent yeah um there are three conditions to be met um first one the invention has to be novel which means that uh, it's not um it's it, it's it's not um disclosed um in any written or verbal or um form whatsoever to the to the public um no, it's not it's not um uh, connected just to the country uh of your origin or uh you know if i would say to the europe but to the whole world actually and to the whole um you know landscape of scholars in in from from the beginning up to now uh the second condition is actually uh invention has to be inventive it, this means that um it has to um incorporate some kind of inventive step which means that um the knowledgeable uh, person from that field would uh, see it as a new invention and the third one, it has to be uh, usable. And here is the list of the state of the art, which um, you know, we, which is the first condition to be met. So it has to be novel. And state of the art uh, looks like uh, this. Yeah. Um, so the 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 second uh, subject I would like to go into is um, copyright. Um, it goes for spoken words, written words, and uh, every kind of work you do as a as a, a creator, or it is as an expression of your uh, creativity. Um, you know, it has both economic rights and moral rights. Uh, economic rights can be uh, passed on uh, to another institution or. Uh, when you, for example, submit a paper to a journal, you have to sign that uh, you know they have right for reproduction or um, uh, publishing or whatever, and you are actually signing that you are transferring economic rights to that journal. Yeah, and um, but the moral rights are those rights where you actually. Um, are cited as an author, yeah, and um, and um, the moral rights are infinite, but economic rights are, um, you know, the period uh, it's seventy years after the 
authors uh, that yeah about so as I said it depends on on the on the country um so you know going back to the to the to the initial question uh does uh, copyright has has to be uh registered um it's actually consist uh, exists from the moment the work is created and um registration is not uh, necessary and um um although some countries uh, offer this so-called registration process um but you know the main thing is that just you can prove that uh, this is your uh, uh, your work. You know? If there would be some uh, dispute. So uh, the next thing that I would like to um, stress is uh, trade secrets. Um, it's actually information that is uh, not generally known or easily discovered. Um, it has yeah, a business, commercial, or economic value. Uh, that means that uh, you know, in the right hands, it would it would meant um, a basis for uh, for business actually. Yeah? Um, um, and you know, to have a trade secret, you have to keep it secret. That means that you have to put in uh, some efforts. Um, you know. To not disclose it yeah? or to not uh, be uh, publicly available. Yeah? Um, um, by that, it has some kind of unlimited life yeah? because until the, this trade secret is uh, kept secret, um, you know you can use it to to create some economic or business uh, value. Yeah, and. Um, the moment it becomes public knowledge, uh, you know, this kind of uh, leverage is is, is gone. Uh, one of the most um, um, known, if I may say, trade secrets um, is actually, you know, the, the recipe for uh, Coca-Cola, yeah? Um, you know, a lot of competition is trying to guess what it is in that in that recipe, but you know, nobody came, one might say, it, uh, even close. Yeah. Um, and they're still uh, keeping it uh, secret. Yeah. And I'm sure they will keep it secret for many uh, years uh, also. So, um, yeah. Maybe the means of protection for a trade secret. Why is such importance on trade secret? Because sometimes the knowledge of the researchers cannot be protected by a patent. Yeah, but we have to keep it as a trade secret. Yeah, and um, so you know there are means of protection. Um, of course, limited access to information. Um, you always talk just about benefits, not not how you do it. Um, um, you know, you have uh, contracts in place uh, with with your, uh, you know, employees or colleagues, uh, and of course, uh, you have contracts in place when disclosing uh, details uh, to, you know, a business partner. Yeah. Um, so now we would just go briefly, we started with the previous part on patenting strategy. But here, uh, maybe just a few points that are really, really, really important for you to know. Yeah. So I started to talk about um, patenting uh, strategy before. Yeah. But you know, the main purpose, if you remember, what is the main, um, uh, what are the main conditions to get a patent? Is novelty. Um, uh, so it has to be uh, novel, it has to be invented, inventive, and it has to be uh, applicable. Yeah. So for the novel, it means that it's not pub published anywhere. Yeah. So um, I'm not joking if I may, if I say that you know, at our university there are at least few cases per year where there is a situation where. Um, 
researcher um, actually, um, you know, uh, publish an, an, an article. And then, you know, after two years, when, when, when uh, somebody contact them, you know, for possible collaborations, uh, they come to us and, and they say, you know, I have a new invention and I would like to, you know, for you to, to help me draft a patent application. And, and we go through um, the process where we find out at the end that uh, through, you know, search report that, that the article that was published two years ago um, actually described whole process of, of this new invention. Yeah? And that's why we stress this really, really um, heavily. First patent, then publish. Yeah, it means that you know before you file for a first patent application, yeah, which is called priority patent application, you have to be very, very cautious, and you have to limit disclosure of confidential information. Yeah, that means no publishing in articles. No thesis, uh, no internal kind of uh, um, magazines or whatever. Yeah, only after filing for a first patent application, then it's time to think about how you will uh, disclose um, the information. Because many times, you know, with a patent, there's also a lot of trade secrets connected and a lot of confidential information that has to be kept secret yeah because if you would um you know like to gain some 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 advantage um uh, on the market then this is uh you know the combination of a patent and uh, trade secrets uh, are often um really value for um for a company yeah so again if you know if there is just the one thing that i would like you to uh, to remember um um you have to pay attention at this priority patent application yeah so um after that you know you can file uh, an article and it's also you know more and more we see this strategy from from researchers that they start to draft a, an, an article and uh, just before actually publishing or or yeah publishing they they come to us and they say you know can you check um if here is something worth of patenting and then we start you know the process of drafting patent application or discussion with the patent attorney, if there is something or if 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 there is you know a value, um, and more often than not we you know we do a really quick patent application and then the article is published uh, very soon um, afterwards. Right, um, maybe. It's better to talk when not to patent than um, when to patent. Yeah? And, um, you know, it's good to not to patent when you are too early uh, in deep research and development. That, you know, why? Because you don't know actually the scope of the technology. Um, but it's hard actually to talk about that because it's. Um, and it depends on, on on the cases, yeah. But for sure, it's not, you know, it's not good if if to patent if you don't have funds, yeah. Because uh, with the patenting, there are some costs related, and if you cannot afford to, um, you know, to patent it properly, then it, it it might be better not to patent at all, yeah. Um. So, you know, a major part of patent application is also information about um, understanding of the actual products uh, that will incorporate um, 
the technology. That means that you know in a patent application you will talk about where this technology can be used, and if you don't have actually understanding of actual products, then you will not talk about the scope, yeah, and you will maybe narrow your patent application just on on one field. Yeah? Um, you know the case is that if you are doing the the research on automotive uh, lights, yeah. And you are, you know, understanding your technology just in that scope. You will also write it in a patent application that this technology will solve only technological problems related to uh, automotive sector. Yeah. Although, if you could understand it more broadly, then the 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 just a second. Sorry, I'm working at home, and then as a parent, you you can imagine you are dealt with a lot of a lot of uh, disturbing uh, situations. So, um, the third point was um, so yeah, it's it's to 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 end the 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 idea. Um, so it's in Python application you are talking about. Um, also about the projects and if it's if, if you know the scope of of invention it's always better to include it in in patent application yeah? um and maybe i i will conclude this part just uh, with a with the last one if you do not know if you are the owner of ip right um it's maybe better to solve this issue first uh, maybe it's a, if if it's a joint invention with with another uh, inventor or uh, institution, um, yeah, you have to think about um, how to um, share the invention. You have to think about how who will pay for for protecting and that stuff. Right. Um, so maybe um, I will conclude with with the slide that I started, uh, just for you to um, to know. Yeah. So keep in mind that in one product there are many IP rights, and a lot of that them are um, um, can be registered or secured or. Um, our own can be owned by you, but some of them, like trade secret, um, you know, ha have to be kept in 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 secret uh, for you to to use it in a in a in a commercialization uh, process. Right. Um, to get more knowledge about um, IP, I promote these three uh, search engines. Uh, one is lens.org, one is uh, spacenet.com, and the third one is patents.google.com. Um, at the University of Ljubljana, we also have um, this workshop uh, for researchers on how to find uh, relevant patent documentation. And we use, in, in that workshop, I use actually all three uh, search engines because it depends uh, on the information you are uh, looking for, so um, I encourage you to, to to search for relevant patent documentation uh, because it often uh, broadens your um, kind of look at the at the domain uh, you have. Right. By by that, I'm concluding my second part. Right, and coming to the third part. If you have any questions or 
anything to comment, I invite you to maybe um, also to, to to reach me on on LinkedIn or to send me an email. Yeah, and the third part is actually uh, covering the the impact. Yeah, the impact is is a part. You know, why would you? Why, why would we? Um, put some efforts into the impact because we are at the university, yeah? And our third mission is actually to contribute uh, with our knowledge that we create to the well-being of society, you know? And you know, this means much more than just a profit, yeah? But on the other hand, we have very little tools at hand where we can communicate um, more than just profit, yeah? It's about impact. Impact, it's much broader term and, and, and um, task to communicate than just, um, you know, new, new products and services or whatever, yeah? And the, just to go a step back, so the how do we get from initial research to impact? Um, we do it like you know, broadly speaking, we do it like that. That uh, research funding is is needed for us to to start the initial research, yeah. And by research, we uh, kind of do uh, research outputs, which can be categorized in, into two into two uh, uh, topics, like new knowledge, and uh, you know that is created by by research. So publications, technology, but also on the other hand, innovation and skills and know how. Yeah, and. We use these research outputs um, in, in in a commercialization process um, through various uh, knowledge transfer channels. Yeah, why? Because we would like to get this knowledge or technology or uh, know how or skills uh, be used at the end in you know at, for users for the end users. Yeah first user that would benefit from our knowledge might be students yeah on on the second level maybe companies and on the third level maybe whole society yeah and we do it that by maybe collaborative research which means that you are collaborating with uh, companies maybe via licensing which means that you offer technology to some companies that can incorporate this technology into their product. Uh, we can even, you know, create our own company for uh, to put products uh, on the market. Yeah, uh, we also share the knowledge we create by uh, publications um, and presentations. Yeah, maybe on 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 some. Uh, um, uh, events, yeah. Um, uh, maybe we do some consultancy for some company, and uh, maybe we do some professional development for some company. Yeah? Maybe for the research team to get you know some detailed knowledge what 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 and how the blockchain can be used uh, for their future uh, work. Yeah. So you know the users are startups, the companies, the citizens, the society, the entrepreneurs, um, you know, the big, the small companies, the and you know many other uh, users as well. Yeah, and you know if we are talking about impact, as as stated before, you know there is more than just new jobs created or the new processes that are in place or the profit that the, the company generates. Because, you know, sometimes based on, 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 the, on the knowledge or the research we conduct, there are new policies in place yeah? or the new interventions, which means that 
uh, you know, maybe some some whole domain is done differently because of the research that we conduct. Um, yeah, and at the end, you know, the the maybe the health is improved or you know the civil society. Yeah, so when when we it's related back to the IPR, yeah, it's invention. Yeah, you never never really talk about how you do it, but you talk about the benefits. Yeah, and uh, this is also. Uh, important, um, you know, to, to take a look, um, you know, how how the impact is created, maybe um, in other um, uh, angle. Yeah, so you know, we put the impacts, uh, the the inputs, and the flow of innovation is is um, you know it goes through to various means and. Um, you know, as the result, is actually uh, we aim often for outputs, yeah, and outcomes. But um, the impact is is the ultimate kind of change we bring to society. Yeah, it's not just the outputs and outcomes, and you know, more and more we are asked about the impact of our work. And this really should define our uh, success and reach uh, of our actually time yeah, as a as a researcher. And there are many types of of impacts. Um, yeah, it's not just you know with the with the papers. It's not just academic. Um, sometimes is uh, you know it's connected to technological impact sometimes it's not sometimes it's connected to political impact um sometimes even to educational impact yeah but you know how do you measure impact yeah uh, because you know when you're talking about impact if you are saving one life yeah uh then the reach is maybe small yeah but very important, yeah. But you know, maybe some minimal change in in one sector, as we talked about before. Yeah, it has, you know, huge reach because a lot of users are using that software, yeah, or that 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 update, yeah. But you know, the significance is probably, you know near nothing yeah so you know it, it's it's quite it, it's quite hard to measure impact yeah especially if you are asked in attenders yeah please you know um talk about your impact and of course you are also scored about that yeah and many times that not then not you know this is actually the point where a lot of projects are um, win yeah, or lose. Yeah? And, um, you know, in many tenders, um, they're asking us, you know, from different angles, actually the same, the same information. What is our impact? Um, what, what, what is our expected impact? What will we, um, you know, at the end, achieve with with the activities we will do, yeah. And therefore, um, we started promoting um, uh, UCD impact planning canvas, which is actually um, really nice communication tool. Uh, it's you know it's kind of the roadmap for um, impact planning. It guides users. To identify the challenge, uh, yeah, kind of to to see the potential impact. Uh, it helps, you know, as a communication tool. It helps align uh, the team members, the resources. Uh, helps with definition of value proposition. Um, also, if you use it properly, it kind of engages uh, also others. Um, 
And uh, at the end, you try with it also to at least grasp how you will measure uh, success. Yeah? And it's a canvas, which means that uh, there are boxes and uh, by putting information in, 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 in every box, you craft a comprehensive uh, kind of strategy for achieving uh, and communicating uh, your uh, research uh, impact. Yeah? Um, it's about also, you know, early identification of potential impacts. Um, it guides your thinking about impact uh, in a holistic and systematic uh, way. And um, it prepares everything for you to kind of have really uh, attractive impact statements um, to assist you in writing project proposals. Yeah? Um, so instructions are really straightforward, um, just filling um, individual components. You, you know, there is a sequence you might follow uh, or not. Uh, you use it with uh, post-it notes and it, it takes you about 15 to 30 minutes. We will not do it today because we are lacking um, time. Yeah? But, you know, I encourage you to Google uh, UCD Impact Planning Canvas and take a look um, at their resources. They are more than open on for you to, to learn about it and to use it. Yeah? Um, maybe just a few points um, to share with you. Yeah? Um, you know, with a canvas, you always start at some place. Yeah, You start here or here or even here. And then during the, um, the thinking about the, the content, you will put on, on, on canvas and, and during the exchange of, of, in, of insights and opinions, you know, you start to grow from that from, from that point. Huh? And sometimes the IP is the you know the focal point at the start. Sometimes the the potential impact you will achieve is the you know focal starting point. Um, sometimes you already know, yeah, this is the, you know, this is the unique value proposition with which we will get the, the tender. Yeah. So, you know, it, it depends where you start, but at the end, you always have to, um, you know, use it, uh, systematically. It has three kind of, uh, parts. One part, um, uses facts that uh, relate to your uh, research work, which is a blue one. The Another is facts that are related to your potential impacts. And the core, uh, which is uh, yellow in this case, um, is related to your unique value uh, proposition. Yeah? So, you know, it's, it's like I will, because of the time I will, um, um, I will uh, try to be as brief as possible, but you know, here it's a you know the first point is the challenge. Yeah? Here you would say, you know, for example, if you uh, have a case with with uh, health uh, and uh, you know the the ways we we eat today, uh, here you would say that you know a lot of um, a lot of uh, fast food is eaten by by the youngsters, or um, yeah, we have a lot of obesity problems in in our society. Yeah, and then you would go next. You would keep that, and then you would say, you yeah, know, how how do you um, plan to go about that challenge? Yeah, and you say, for example, you know, a lot of food with less calories or with less fat and and more proteins and and fibers and you know maybe some inventive methods for digestion or whatever and you would go um, with this process through whole uh, canvas and um, at the end you would um, 
you would come up with with uh, yeah with a really um, um, comprehensive actually communication tool that would have all the facts related to your research work, to your uh, potential impacts, and by that you have a really good um, gathering of information which you can use in your um, tenders. Yeah, and uh, maybe just to end. Also, the third part um, that with innovation, yeah, you have a lot of tools available. You have to find it. But here I listed um, quite, quite some um, that I use daily in, in, in my work that we use at the University of uh, Ljubljana. And that helps actually us uh, to be um, good at technology transfer. Uh, processes. Yeah, but by that I'm actually I'm also concluding my um, my part of the presentation. Uh, if there are any questions, you know you have or um, or whatever, uh, I'm available for you know always to 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 send me an email to connect with me. Uh, via LinkedIn or or to connect to University of Ljubljana uh, via Sebastian. I hope you enjoyed and uh, yeah, Sebastian, I I give the floor back to you. Thank you very much, Peter. Really great overview, great presentations. Um, a lot of uh, the the basics really um very condensed, of course, in in a short time. So so a lot of things to to really take in. Um, yeah, maybe to just check back, are there any, any questions, anything um, that the participants would really like to ask or comment now or anything that you would like to put in between? Doesn't seem to be the case. Then- Yeah, um, it's, it's, it's a condensed. It's, it's a lot it's on, a condensed. yes, yeah. of course. So in this, uh, this way, it's also maybe a very good opportunity to mention that following this webinar, we're organizing a couple of other events that are also then making use of some of the tools, um, each of them that uh, Peter already mentioned in specific contexts so that, that you can really um, try and um, use those things that we have now seen in the, in the overview. So these are follow-up events that we will also, also advertise and uh, they will be spread out um, through um, the, the second half of April and May, and uh, even um, in the, the first half of June. So in the, the coming um, two and a half months, there's still a couple of the events where you can really then deepen these insights and make use of it and really see, aha, this is how it's, it's uh, worked out and this is how it's, it's benefiting. Um, in the remaining time, since we announced this for, for two hours, and I have also prepared uh, a little bit um, for the, the wrap-up session, um, but since we had so much um, really nice, really good, but also really condensed theory, um, I would suggest that we go go forward with the second part, um, or very shorter part, really just more more uh, like a wrap up, and um, start with an interactive um, interactive intermezzo, a brief interactive thing um, on Mentimeter. Uh, for this, I have also prepared a link in the chat. Um, so I would kindly invite you to. Join the Mentimeter and um, let us together use a few minutes to, to then um, see and uh, work a few things out together before we come to the uh, final part of the right part. Okay. So let's briefly wait for it to connect. Uh -huh. I see thumbs are, thumbs are going, going up. So uh, you are slowly but steadily connecting. Um, since we're already quite well into the um, uh, last half hour, then I would say we'll go uh, briefly forward. We'll have the joining instructions also following um, in the next slides in the, in the top. And as mentioned in the chat, there's also the link, so you can still relatively easily join on. So um, I hope you're more or less familiar with the Menti. Um, this is a nice tool to um, get a couple of insights. And so for this webinar, um, what I would particularly like you to provide us as feedback, first of all, is where are you based? This would be super interesting to see where you all are actually from. 
open simply on the um, smartphone or if you have it open on the computer, simply drag and put your, your um, little pin wherever you are. And then the whole thing is anonymous, so it's no, no connected answers or anything, but at least we will have a nice overview where you are based also for further follow up activities to then see um, how can we best connect this to our organization, our partners, and how we can be, uh, yeah, also be, be of more help for you in this kind of matter. So I hope there's more than uh, than one colleague still active. Uh -huh. Let's see. Nice. Not the, the easiest, not the, the most intuitive part with the, the pins on the on the map, so it might be taking a while, yes. So you should also have the opportunity to go forth and back. So I will briefly skip skip forward, not to, to lose too much time, just in waiting for everyone to drag their, their pins to the right position. Um, so follow-up question then are uh, would be, where are you from? Since a lot of us are mobile, and particularly we're looking into um, how to, to support displaced or refugee um, academics. Um, the following part and specifically then also would relate what we saw so far um, to the, the conditions of, of refugees and displaced academics. So the interesting part then would be not just where are currently based, but where you came from. Personally, for me, I am originally from, from Germany and came to Slovenia not as a refugee, but just as a, as a regular migrant, just as a regular, regular mobile um, researcher. Being interesting to see where you all are from. Um. Right in the, the eastern part of the Kremlin. Yeah. Let's quickly, or let's let's briefly go forward. As said, uh, anyone who still wants to put their their points can can still uh, complete that also in the next minute since the the whole survey is still open. But the interesting part would also be about your research field. A lot of the topics that we talked about are very technical. We heard about the patents and um, those kind of protection of uh, intellectual property. That's and in many uh, many ways related more to the technical sciences, engineering, natural natural sciences. Um, okay. um, so yeah, um, indeed, also uh, to um, all of the, the the other kind of categories. So um, innovation activities um, and also intellectual property. That's something that's just as as important in all fields of of science and in all fields of research. That's including the humanities. That's including the social sciences. Um, and so um, this is, of course, something um, that, um, yeah, the presentations so far um, focus a lot of more the, the technical parts. Um, maybe we'll see how also um, particularly social sciences and humanities are gaining increasing um, impact and are gaining increasing um, focus in, in all these kind of matters. So I'm slowly going to advance also this part. Um, so. First of all, I would, would be very interested to then also learn after this long presentation with all those bases, um, with these features, different tools, all these different insights. If you now, after the long presentation, look into those different um, those different words, those different expressions that you see, um, how relevant would, would you say these are, um, are for you? Are you strongly agreeing that they are highly relevant for you? Or are you rather disagreeing, thinking they are not very relevant for, for you in your field of work? Interesting. So 
particularly social impact is, is a very high relevance, obviously, for, for a lot of our participants. Patents, copyright, more more mixed feelings, it's it seems. Entrepreneurship, more more mixed feelings. So that speaks to, to what I was was um, was referring before that uh, a lot of the things that we have seen um, so far in the presentation were highly related or were, were exemplified by a lot of technical examples, but don't just relate to the technical examples. We're going to share the, the insights. I said this is all anonymous, so you don't don't worry, but I'm going to share the insights also afterwards so you can, can have uh, some, some more ideas, some more insights um, about your colleagues who are here with you. Um, and finally, um, as the last slide, um, are you aware of the, the typical phrasing, like what are the three missions of universities? What are universities there for? Since we speak about academics, all of us as academics have undergone probably one or the other kind of university um, education uh, or in the middle of it. So whether you're a student, whether you are a postdoctoral researcher, maybe you're a professor or you left university, uh, went to, to work somewhere as a researcher, but in all likelihood, you have uh, been for quite some time at, at universities if you're not, not still there. And so the, the question then would be, what are universities there for? What's, what's the mission of a university? Research, teaching, and impact. Uh -huh. This just yet. Um, you just post whatever you think is the, the right thing, whatever you think. Um, yeah, it's most most appropriate. Research, researching, teaching. else should the university do? What is the, the university networking, education? So I suggest please do Keep adding things um, if you think about them. I would change the, the screen share and go forward and show you what um, my thoughts or other people's thoughts are on, on this and how this then connects. So if we go go forward, three missions of, uh, of a university, uh, what we find in, in many publications are essentially those, those things that also you put in there. Uh, one is the education part, teaching, education, however you put it. Um, so the provision of knowledge to other people for then the benefit of society, for, for the benefit of all uh, sorts of many actors, not just for, for, for basic research, but knowledge provision, teaching in general. One particular part is performing the research. And of course, with the... Um, with the whole training we are looking into today with the innovation and all that's connecting there, um, that's of course heavily based on the research activities, um, but not necessarily exclusively. And those two are mostly focused on in, in many of the uh, of the communications that, that we have and that we, that we hear. It's also this typical Humboldtian idea um, that teacher, te teaching and research should go hand in hand. Um, but yes, we should of course not um, forget that universities are there in society for a reason that also then is expected that universities have an impact in society, in the economy, in, in um, yeah, our everyday lives. And that's also then um, to, to a degree, of course, the, the reason that our societies are using taxpayer money, public money to fund the universities because they're expecting some payout from this, not monetary payout necessarily, but some benefits that the university really shows some impact, shows their relevance to society. And so these are typically the, the three missions. And um, yeah, as I said, quite often this uh, so-called third mission is overlooked. And particularly with societal relevance, that's of course linking back um, again also to what humanities and social um, sciences really um, do best. We are um, we're having lags in, in many ways um, in the, the works um, of the natural sciences and the engineering, where 
those fields um, can can uh, take up better practices or uh, need insights from the other fields as well. And yeah, where um, we also then lead over to much more insights on how our societies are changing and how our economies are changing. And uh, so just in a few minutes, just very briefly to introduce this, this concept of Industry 4.0 and Industry 5.0 um, to you, because this is also something you will occur uh, encounter in um, a lot of occasions, and particularly also if you're looking into the funding and um, follow-up activities. So let's briefly go through. Um, Industry 4.0 indicates that there's a um, 1.2 point and 3.0 that came before that, and indeed, and that's that's the case. So um, in a way, this is going through different phases of industrial revolutions. If you think about the industrial revolution, the, the first thing um, started more or less in the um, late 18th century and went into the, the 19th century with steam power engines and the, the whole mechanization of, of production. So the, the, really the industrialization in, in its uh, first place. Then there's the, the second um, um, big revolution in the industrialization and this second industrial revolution um, second industrial revo uh, revolution um, that's uh, essentially the, the mass production. If you look into different sources, the times that the frame will vary a bit. One uh, one source says, well, it begins uh, right be some, uh, sometime shortly before the, the year 1900. Others say, well, it's more about the year 1920, 30, when it really took off with the mass productions. This exact framing doesn't matter so much. The, the point is, first, we started to mechanize things to, to get to actual industry. Um, then it was uh, the, the second evolution was uh, with the mass production with ex assembly lines, also particularly making use of electricity to speed up things, improve things. The third industrial re um, re revolution, sorry, the third industrial revolution was particularly with microcomputers, um, microprocessors, all this automation coming in. Um, and uh, that's something that we still see quite quite a bit um, being transferred into industry, but that's something that's of course uh, more like around the, the middle or started ma mainly in the, the middle of the, the, the previous century. And the fourth industrial revolution is then uh, one that we have recently lived through and that's, that's still um, finding its impact. And that's with connected systems. So these are typical terms like internet of things. Um, this is something particularly um, as a German native, uh, as, as I am, uh, we have this this uh, very interesting um, quotation from our politicians from a few years ago, uh, where the minister responsible for digitalization uh, publicly announced, yeah, well, it's not like we will need uh, Wi-Fi at every milk can or something, uh, when, well, indeed we do. That's the whole point of Internet, for, uh, Internet of Things. That's the whole point, the interconnectivity of all the production processes that allows to um, really uh, make use of higher efficiencies that better up op to better optimize processes and um, yeah to uh, to have a much much better working kind of industry um, so this is the whole digitalization internet of things kind of sphere and industry 5.0 it's uh, still more or less that the next hot kind of thing so that's where we are at at the moment. Uh, we see things are quite speeding up in these kind of uh, new developments and new re um, revolutions coming in. So yeah, then let's let's take a quick look. What is Industry 4.0? Uh, Once again, what is Industry 5.0? Industry 5.0 is um, first and foremost an economy that works for the people. It includes also other big policy uh, um, priorities. So it also um, should be something that's sustainable, that makes use of the resources that we have and not um, you know, go over uh, over the limits and not be sustainable into the future. It should properly include um, the, the digital age and all those technologies, including social media, including all these kind of interconnectedness. And um, yeah, thereby, first and foremost, center around the, the people, the human-centric, and make use of, of that. And so there's Lots of different different aspects that come into play. So on the one hand side, resilience against crisis is, is a big part that counts into Industry 4 and 5.0, the, the sustainability with circular economies, with energy efficiency, and all these kind of things is a huge part of it. Uh, but uh, the, the most important, most dominant thing is the centricity around people. It's not just to have um, production processes with nice production lines that uh, make use of automation and are interconnected, like the first four steps of, of uh, the industrial revolutions, but also it's something that through these, these bases and with uh, the 
um, digital tools that we have with the interconnectivity and all these things that we have, we can make use of either uh, production processes that are centered around individual people where you can individualize the, the products, where you can make use of the connected people of those um, social spheres, those social platforms to actually get to an added value and where you can make the, the use of this also to support people in a, in a proper way. And that's something, of course, very relevant um, in everything that we see with uh, health, mental health, and all these kind of kind of things that are developing, as we also saw in the uh, briefly mentioned in the in the chat um, of the the webinar today. So um, industry 5.0 and connected to this um, renewed innovation processes that make the whole use of this um, really much much more. So we already heard about the open innovation that we're not just um, being into these very narrow lanes and um, yeah, uh, looking very narrowly onto onto our development of any product of, or of any new uh, innovative kind of thing, but um, it's something where we can make use out of the box. We can do crowdsourcing. We can connect with people. Um, something that includes continuous learning, collaboration, whole ecosystems to do the innovation. So that's the the general idea, the general spirit of this innovation 5.0. Um, that's based on the, the whole industry 5.0 kind of concept. So much for, for concept, so much as a next step to, to build on and to make the use of the, the tools we saw before. Now, if you look into the specific parts for refugees, for displaced academics, um, one particular thing that, uh, that we saw um, so far is, well, um, there's so many things that the universities can make use of, can offer you, can help you um, with for, for these kind of innovation uh, processes and for, for all the intellectual property rights and whatnot is connected to this. Um, however, so these kind of things are sometimes critically discussed as we heard, well, do, do I apply for a patent or do I publish an article? You can do both. Usually if you have a, have a good connection at your university, you notify the university as you're typically supposed to be. Um, you notify them about any of these kind of new um, invention that you made, something that's made usable. They get to work already while you are writing up your article. And if everything runs smoothly, they will be able to submit the patent on time that you can still well on time for your research project, submit your uh, scientific articles and go through the process. And in a way you get the additional publication as the patent that's then commercially usable and you get your scientific publication for the scientific card of pathway. All good, all nice, um, but it depends on the local ecosystem. It depends on the local laws. And we'll take a little look into this just over a few minutes, not to go into too much over time. So um, for this, we base this on the Agile Consortium. We see where all our partner institutions are located and with the logos with different universities and institutions. Um, let's take a, take a quick look how this looks in the different places. And particularly with the question then, are there any obligations for the research or something that I must do? Is there any opportunities or any support available for us? And what are the legal obstacles, particularly taking in, or having in mind the situation of Space researchers, researchers or refugee researchers, how does this look like? And just for, for disclaimer there, this is not a um, professional formal legal advice. So it's I'm expressing our understanding. We did communicate with our departments, we did uh, the, the table of research, but I'm not a, not a legal advisor. So in any proper questions, you should consult the university's legal department, obviously, or a law office in your country. We um also happy to, to help there, connect to the corresponding departments and help in the, the process. Um, but yeah, take it take it with this uh, kind of disclaimer. Um, let's go to the to the countries and institutions. So um, as, a, as a German in Germany, um, there's a relatively strict route that apply to me. If I'm employed at a university as a researcher, then I'm by law mandatory required if I have any kind of invention, anything that I encounter during my work that might be uh, able to be commercially exploited. I must notify my employer. It's not a question, do I want to or do I not want to? I must. The employer then, of course, need to, needs to credit me with this. If there's any, any paybacks from licenses or so forth, I'm gonna be involved in that. But um, generally, the inventions that I do at work, those I need to um, communicate to my employer. How is this uh, determined? Well, in very simple terms, anything on the field that my employer works on uh, is, uh, then um, being taken as this encounter, uh, this is something I had at work or related to my work. So for the universities, for most of the universities with a broad spectrum of research and applications that it's covering, usually anything, any invention that comes to mind would be covered by the universities. So I would need to notify them and they 
start the process of patent applications if they deem it worthwhile, or hand it back to me, or whatnot. There's a lot of different uh, different options they can go with. There are usually at all the the universities there are some support services available, but they vary a little bit. The big question though is outside of peer contracts. So if I'm not employed or enrolled as a student, or I have a partnership agreement uh, in collaboration uh, out of a out of a company, if this is not uh, in any science, such kind of clear contract, then relations are super unclear. Um, in, uh, if you look specifically to this, like in our in our project consortium, University of Hamburg is the uh, is a, a project partner. They have a super nice um, trans central agency for all the talent transfer, and this is not just for technology transfer, but it's a very broad thing, starting with the innovation entrepreneurship. We're going over to career qualification and something more co-creation engagement that's really then involving the, the uh, public and the, the general society. So there's a lot of things where they're supporting, a lot of things that can be done together with them or it's researchers, teachers and students. If you're a refugee and have not an employment contract with them or are not enrolled at the university, they um, will need to decide this on a case-by-case -case basis but are uh, the, the relations are really then not clear because you did do something at their premises likely as someone who's uh, located there physically. But then really the, the background is super unclear and needs to be discussed on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's something that we'll see going to repeat itself. If we look into Slovenia, the IP laws are roughly modeled after how it's in Germany. So it's again, as a researcher at the Slovenian university, I need to notify them if I have made any invention. Um, and they take care of the, the next steps. There's support services available, and we saw a lot of things already during the webinar now. Um, but again, outside of peer contracts, if I'm not employed or enrolled or have a specific partnership agreement through my project, and it's unclear, and in, if in doubt, most likely they will not be able to help me because they have a very clear, defined working environment. Um, but yes, as you saw, there's a lot of things going on. Um, they have contact points for the researchers, for the students, also for outsiders, so from the industry or from, from society to connect with. They have a whole portfolio of technologies from the university where supporting spin outs and um, the offers are very broad. So from the protection of the IP and the con uh, consultation there to through strategic marketing, training events and um, hackathons and, and uh, anything like that. Um, there's a collaboration with the incubator to then really go into entrepreneurship and startup formation. So a lot of, of different kinds of offers, but again, to members of the university. So uh, again, if it comes to refugee researchers located at our university, it's an individual decision case by case that we need to clear out really with them on this case by case basis. And friends, the IP laws are, um, to, to our understanding, or to my understanding, a little bit um more um, detailed in, in some ways as, 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 for example, in Germany. So again, um, if I'm employed somewhere, I need to notify about the invention. Um, however, the ownership part is a little bit more nuanced. Um, so um, you don't um, necessarily also need to have this as an, uh, as an employment contract. If you're working with the materials of the university or using the studies of the university, this already can be enough to justify the, the IP relations and to justify the availability of their support services. But again, also in that case, if there's not a legal contract, they need to decide on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's something that needs to be negotiated with them. Um, this is the case also for the, the participating universities. Those two are um, not generally based in uh, technology um, kind of um, studies. It's not uh, mainly uh, the STEM fields, but it's more social sciences, humanities, languages, linguistics, and other these kind of fields. Nevertheless, they have units in place that are um, related to this. So for the University of Paris 8 in uh, uh, Saint-Denis, um, they have a digital center for social innovation. So you see the innovation part becomes more important and the social part becomes much more important there. And um, this is supposed to be a meeting place, again, between academics and then between social, economic, and institutional actors. So again, something where a transfer of research outcomes, a transfer of insights is done to make use of this to generate impact. Um, so this is, in a way, the same kind of idea, the same kind of mission, like with the technology transfer office in Ljubljana, where it's in Ljubljana named much more about technical things, but also working on 
sociologic, humanistic, and other kinds of um, kind of fields. Correspondingly, in Bordeaux, um, there's um, not a, a single unit, um, but rather they have um, sort of outsourced this through different uh, three different external initiatives and uh, innovation campus in the campus of the metropole region. Um, everything relating more to, to uh, intercultural issue issues is through the um, intercultural social innovation project. And um, for, for some of their, their fields, um, the Archeovision product project is the, the sort of innovation initiative that you would connect to. Um, so here directly at university, there's not a the single contact point, rather it's something in the, the larger region where you can still connect to, but you will find people at least um, that will um, tell you uh, how to, to advance with this and will also be able to provide some support. Uh, yeah, as you see, it's much less structured also in this kind of way in the support um, services at uh, the French universities. However, in France, there's much more also support systems um, uh, available <coughs> to the national funders who are um, more broadly organized there. So, um, uh, so also through um, the uh, CNRS, for example, there's opportunities to make your innovation become something with an impact. If we look into Lithuania, again, this is roughly similar to, to Germany. So again, this goes via the university and also support services are in place and are quite well developed. In this case, specifically for Kaunas University, <coughs> they have a long established innovation entrepreneurship center. This is established together with other universities and other institutes um, to join resources and uh, be more um, really impactful, more efficient with this. Um, different from the French side, this is also available in Lithuanian and English. So this helps very much, of course, for refugees or for um, non-nationals, where in France, um, as we saw in the screenshots before, this was all in French. So here, um, they are much more encompassing uh, for this. Uh, they write, the center is open for all scientists, researchers, students, and entrepreneurs, um, but they don't have any specific um, position on uh, how to, to deal with scientists who are not directly under employment contract with any of their funding institutions. So again, even though the right open for all, it's a case by case decision with them just as well. And then coming back to, to Ukraine, in Ukraine, the IP laws are somewhat different in that there's no automatic this kind of assignment. So even if you have an employment contract, it's not as strictly defined as it is, for example, in Germany. Um, <laughs> that generally the employer uh, gains the right on the um, in, uh, on the inventions and then also takes care of patenting or these kind of parts. But it's something that needs to be clarified in each and every legal agreement. So this is something that's not just depending on the university where you're at, but it's depending specifically on the contract that you have signed with the university. This can be different from, uh, from researcher to researcher, from one contract to the other. Um, particularly for our uh, project member, the uh, Lviv Polytechnic Univers National University, um, the big unit that has been recently established for this is the Cyber Action Center. And they encompass essentially two big spheres. One is the, the innovation part with training, with a hub of knowledge, with also support for innovation activities and the, the protection of IP. And the second part is actually a cybersecurity um, Part. It's, this is something that um, has, for, for very obvious reasons, I think, um, gained more intensity and more attention in Ukraine than it has yet at a lot of the Western European universities. Um, it's increasing there in, um, in attention just as well. Um, but uh, it's something that, uh, of course, Ukraine has been exposed much more to, to these kind of things and uh, issues connected to cybersecurity. And so this is something where they pay much more attention than many of our other universities, um, Western most from, from uh, Ukraine, um, at least just yet. Um, the center has been established together between six different um, universities across Ukraine, um, truly make the best um, out of this. And so uh, each of them has, has their regional center for these kind of topics. Um, and yeah, with the conclusion, uh, the conclusion of this is that there are some mandatory uh, obligations um, and there is access to support services, um, but 
how these look like, how they apply to you as a refugee researcher or also as a, uh, as a displaced researcher, maybe displaced internally within Ukraine, is highly unclear uh, because it's relating to the different legal environments, the different contexts that are there or are not there. And so um, this is something that has not systematically been solved. It's something that also we got generally in, in preparation of the webinar as a, the, the feedback from our technology transfer or other uh, related offices that um, this has not really been any active case for them yet. And um, in my words, they do not have refugees or displaced researchers on their radar. The same conditions, however, apply also to um, researchers with a fellowship. You don't need to be a refugee. You can have any kind of a fellowship that's not through an employment contract. You have the same open question. How is this now for me? So this is something that really should be addressed. Um, and it's something where we are, at least with our universities, communicating. But for the time being, an individual um, case basis, case by case evaluation. And same as uh, Peter said before, um, if you have any questions, if you have any any case that you want to, to follow up on and are related maybe also to one of our partner organizations, reach out to us. We're happy to support you and arrange for the, the proper consultation and follow follow up activities to really figure out what's available, how can we can support you. Now, it's been a very long webinar. Um, thank you for everyone who uh, really followed through for so long, uh, who paid attention for, for so, so long time. I really do hope it has been um, has been useful for for you. Um, as we said before, um, there's going to be follow up um, follow up activities that we're also organizing. We're going to share the, the video. Right before I uh, conclude the call, uh, I would also um, very much um, hope for for getting some insight if this was useful for you or if you had other expectations. Um, or um, yeah, if there's anything else you would like to uh, to communicate to us, of course, you're very welcome to also reach out to us in any way. You saw the emails. You also have uh, have my email from the, the previous notification from the, the posters. Um, you have the project name and can um, can get back to us with, with this. So we'll be super happy for any of your feedback and for you coming back. That with the follow-up events, hopefully this will also provide you some more hands-on experience then to really make use of the tools that Peter has so far shown to us. Yeah.